Okay, so next up we've got Stephen Murray. Uh, his title is Large Scale Discovery of Embryonic Lethal Phenotypes in Mice. Great. All right. Okay, well, thanks to the organizers for putting this together and thank Martin for an outstanding introduction because then I can introduce the entire IMPC with his acknowledgement slide and simply to say not only was the work of the adult phenotyping that you just heard about uh, a large scale consortium effort, so was the embryonic phenotyping. So obviously, as Martin said, one of the major goals of the IMPC is to produce uh, cohorts of adult mice for a large series of clinical tests and clinical screens, but one thing became very apparent very early in the process is that when we're producing our cohorts, we're going to identify a large number of uh, cases, and we predicted somewhere around the third, where we'd either uh, see 0% homozygote animals coming through, or this very interesting case that unfortunately I'm not going to be able to talk much about today, which is our, our subviable lines, which are those where we get less than half the expected Mendelian ratios of homozygotes. So the question was, what can we do with this? First of all, how will we see the same numbers of uh, lethal strains as we predict? Uh, from, from the literature so far, and, and what do we do with these? In the original iteration of the IMPC pipeline, there was uh, very little that we did in order to understand these phenotypes. And, and what we're seeing so far, this is from an earlier data freeze. This is 751 knockout alleles that we had somewhere near the end of the year. And as you can see, we're, we're actually, in terms of def, uh, defining the essential genes, we're right where, or very close to what we predicted, which is about a third of the genome we're defining as essential, and that is those that are truly embryonic lethal at the wean stage versus those that are uh, subviable somewhere around 10 or 11 percent. What's very interesting is that these numbers have been consistent over time from the beginning of the IMPC, and they're consistent with what's been in the published literature, which is telling us that as we go into sort of the ignorome, the, the dark reaches of the genome where there's very little known about those genes, we're still seeing the same level of uh, essentiality in our genes. So in order to build it, we, we just, we went ahead to build an entire pipeline to characterize these embryo, uh, embryonic lethal phenotypes, and I want to walk you through fairly quickly through what we put together. For the, for the IMPC and the COMP2 program, uh, we started this mid-gestation screen where we identify, first of all, are we achieving embryos with the right genotype ratio? We also look and assess gross morphology. If they are lethal at this stage, we, we jump back to a, a, an earlier stage at E9.5 and we assess with the same viability and gross morphology, but we also add a high-resolution 3D data set or data morph, uh, uh, modality, uh, imaging modality that allows us to uh, collect uh, very rich data sets that uh, others can analyze and we can analyze as well. Um, if, we, if they're viable and we uh, note a phenotype, we move to what we call the organogenesis stage, which is E15.5. Um, you'll also hear, or we, uh, this is a perfect stage for uh, using iodine, uh, iodine contrast micro CT in order to generate high resolution 3D data sets at this stage, and I'll show you some more of this data in a moment. Um, you'll hear more in a moment from uh, Jackie about the DMDD program, which moves directly to E14.5. These are all time points that uh, can be chosen. Uh, there, there's a flexibility in this, of course, and they use a, a different imaging modality at this stage. But the idea is that we both generate high-resolution 3D more, uh, uh, data sets at this stage. And finally, some of the centers proceed to uh, E18.5 when we either they're viable and we don't know it's a phenotype at E12.5. And we've also developed tools to generate micro-CT data at that stage as well. Um, of course, going through this tiered process allows us to establish windows of lethality between the different, uh, for each gene, and one of the most interesting outcomes here is, first of all, that a large proportion of the genes that we've analyzed thus far uh, are actually lethal prior to E9.5. And when I say lethal, this means there's not either an active heartbeat, an embryo, a homozygous embryo, or no homozygous embryos are identified at all. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we're also finding that uh, a large percentage of our, our genes are also lethal after the latest time point we examine, be that either E15.5 or E18.5, depending on the center. Many of these we predict will be in the perinatal period, but this is an active area investigation in the consortium. What's particularly interesting is a small number of genes that actually are, uh, lead to lethality in, this, in these intermediate stages. But I'd like to note that this is just viability. This is just whether or not there's a, a live embryo at these stages. A large number that we examine at the E15.5 stage actually display a phenotype. So phenotype is not the same thing as lethal, so we have to make sure we distinguish these two. 
This is just an example of one of our novel findings and one of the reasons why we think the E18.5 stage is really worthwhile to look at for uh, embryo phenotype or for, for uh, micro CT. SVEP1, this is a, a gene for which very little is known. There's almost no publications about it. It's a secreted protein. That's really all we know. Yet it has a, a really uh, uh, quite dramatic and, and apparent phenotype in multiple tissues. You can see the edema. Uh, right here, you can see the defective development of the kidney, uh, renal pelvis, uh, the obvious lung hypoplasia and, and, and thin myocardium. You can also see really disorganized uh, brown adipose and what is very clearly uh, uh, a poor musculature development. So this is the type of data we can generate. These are the types of uh, vignettes and stories we can p produce. And this will hopefully inspire others to go further with this gene and gives them more added information to, to go to the next step. Uh, we also, of course, are phenotyping the adults, and we frequently see interesting phenotypes in the heterozygotes that could be relevant to the embryonic phenotypes. So this is all, uh, we can take all of this data together to build a narrative about this particular gene function, genes function. Um, we're doing more than just the simple point and look type of approach to our micro CT data set. We can uh, use it working with some of the tools developed by Michael Wong and Mark Hinkelman's lab. Uh, this allows us to do violent, true quantitative volumetric comparison of the mutants versus the controls. Um, and, when you, and when compared to a segmented atlas, we can quantitatively determine this dis, the volumetric changes in individual structures that have been uh, uh, carefully painted into this overall atlas. Here's an example of that data. Uh, so this is, uh, and I, of course, not put the gene name on here. I apologize for that. This is CVX4. This is a known knockout. This is a knock it, and it has been reported to have a smaller thymus. You can see right here, the blue is showing you a much smaller uh, structure overall. But what wasn't reported was the smaller adrenals, which you can, uh, you can just see here in the light blue spots, and certainly the smaller trigeminal glands, uh, or trigeminal ganglia right here. Uh, in this structure, in this uh, uh, slice as well. One of the things that's notable is that the, 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 the smaller trigeminal glana, uh, ganglia would be very difficult to spot if just looking through and pawing through these individual images. So this, allows, this heat map allows us to identify areas uh, to, to, to look at a little more closely. When we register to an atlas, we can actually quantitate these differences. These are the differences in the thymus and the differences in the adrenal. Of course, the atlas doesn't actually currently uh, capture the, the ganglia, so uh, this is one potential future development is to expand this atlas to capture more structures. The other, one of the other things we've noticed, obviously we've seen it with the subviability, is variable expressivity in our phenotypes. And one thing that Martin mentioned is that all of these are done on an isogenic C57 black 6 background. So one would expect a lot of uh, uniformity in the phenotypes, and that is not actually what we're seeing. So for example, uh, in uh, all of our subviable lines are lethal at some variable rate that was not predictable. We're also seeing it in the embryonic phenotypes as well. And so this is just simply one example. This is SN uh, SNX3, our normal control samples. This is a normal surface rendering of an E15.5 embryo. And one thing you can see right here is that we, we, we see a variety of different phenotypic outcomes when we mutate this gene. So the question becomes, what is the source of it? What is the, what is the reason behind variable expressivity on a defined genetic background? It's clearly not genetic. So we were, this is an area of uh, uh, active interest and investigation for us right now. And we certainly believe this is something that we can look for in our adult data sets as well. I want to spend the rest of my time talking about some of the work we've done uh, looking at our gene list and trying to relate it to understand the uh, 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 nature of essential genes when we compare to human essential genes. So one of the, in just the last year, three very interesting publications came out uh, screening for genes that were essential for uh, in humans, but mostly within a cell culture context. So these are all essential genes in, using different tools in vitro. And so we wanted to know is the essential gene list that we're developing using uh, in vivo models, how well does it correlate with these human essential genes? And when we compare our core, our essential gene list with the core essential gene list from each of these publications, which is into, there are different cell lines represented here all in this Venn diagram, the thing that comes out of it is that uh, a rem there's a remarkable concordance. The vast majority of the genes identified as essential here in humans were essential. In mice, you can see the percentage that are discordant is extremely low. When we take all of these discordant genes and we, we merge them together, there's only three, actually, that we can 
go back and manually identify as being truly uh, uh, non-essential in the mouse, but essential in the human. So it's a remarkable concordance between mouse and human. That is not entirely unexpected. We also want to understand the impact of essential gene identification on our ability to understand human disease. So what we did initially is we took um, our IMPC essential list, which is all of our lethal and subviable genes, and our IMPC non-essential list. We merged this with the existing MBI, MGI uh, essential and non-essential list. And then we, we identified the human orthologs for all of these to come up with these uh, lists of essential genes versus non-essential genes. And we went into both the HGMD, with the Human Gene Mutation Database, and also a GWAS catalog, and we looked for whether or not there's any enrichment uh, in these disease genes. And what we found is quite remarkable. The essential genes themselves, if we look at the proportion of essential genes that are actually HGMD disease genes, you can see it's nearly 40% versus the non-essential genes, which are, so it's highly enriched versus non-essential genes overall. So essential, identifying essential genes itself is an excellent first step in identifying and characterizing human disease genes. This is simply another way to look at it. If you look at all of the HGMD genes, you can see uh, a, a large proportion are actually essential, uh, and it's roughly equivalent to the non-essential genes, but of course, remember, there are far fewer essential genes overall, and of course, uh, a large, a decent percentage of unknown, and of course, this is a great target for the IMPC in the future. What's really remarkable to us is that when we look at the uh, GWAS studies, when we look at the nearest genes surrounding GWAS hits, we see a similar enrichment. So this, doesn't, this isn't just relevant to Mendelian disease, uh, complex diseases as well. So um, identification of essential genes could be a useful tool moving forward. Um, so when we look at our overall, this is simply a list of the novel lethal disease genes that we were able to identify. These are from 399 human orthologs of IMPC-only uh, identified essential genes. We've identified 52 novel ones. These are all, this is just the big list right here. I put this here so I can mention GYG1. Um, unfortunately, Mary Dickinson's talk was moved to a different session, uh, and she has some great data about how um, our embryo lethal analysis has identified or has uh, informed on this particular disease gene, so I encourage you to go see her talk. I believe it's on Friday morning. Um, the, uh, we, we continued our analysis of uh, uh, essential genes and trying to understand its Im importance genome-wide, and we used a tool called, uh, and we wanted to understand uh, whether or not essential genes are related to gene genetic tolerance in humans. So genetic tolerance is the idea that uh, uh, in, in human data sets, you can get less than or greater than expected numbers of coding mutations, and that genes for which there are fewer than the expected number of coding mutations, there's purifying selection uh, that, is, of course, removes them from the genome. So the, a tool is developed by David Goldstein's group called Residual Variance and Tolerance Score. It's basically a method that just rank orders genes based on whether or not they deviate from the uh, expected mutation frequency. So the idea here is that you have a reference exome or some whole genome sequence data set, and then you can rank them here, and this is, uh, so you get either greater than or fewer than the expected number of mutations. Wow, that clock's going fast. So we did this using uh, the, a large exome data set known as the exact data set, and you can see that we, uh, in this, what we did is we, so we developed an RVS S score, actually David Goldstein's group did and published it online using uh, uh, this very large exome data set. And so we asked this question using the same set of core essential genes as I just spoke about. Um, when, we fit, when we compare our human orthologs of essential and non-essential genes, do we see any enrichment in essential genes and those that are uh, showing gen genetic intolerance in humans? And of course, the, the answer, maybe not too surprising, but the uh, degree of enrichment was quite striking, which is that indeed, um, if we look at uh, uh, essential genes, they are scoring very low in the RVIS overall percentile, which means our essential genes are quite, mutations in them are not tolerated in humans at all. So the question then becomes, uh, what exactly does this mean? Uh, and so this is very preliminary data. I believe this is my last slide. Um, so one of the things that was clear is that we have a lot of these genes that show clear intolerance in humans, and they are essential in 
that we identified in our study, but they're not currently annotated as a disease gene at this point. So we asked, you know, perhaps we could go into various uh, databases that have research variants, variants that have not, don't have enough evidence to assert as a disease gene, but perhaps uh, uh, have some preliminary variation associated with the disease. And sure enough, in a very preliminary look, we were able to identify some of our most intolerant genes as having variants in a variety of different databases for which uh, these are this current area of uh, active research, but there isn't sufficient evidence to put it into OMIM or HGMD at this point. So this is a, something we're very interested in pursuing further in, in the future. These are obviously just a few uh, 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 casual looks. We haven't looked comprehensively at this point, so it's something we're looking at in the near future. Uh, very finally, this is, Martin mentioned, this is the IMPC portal. This is where you go to search for your gene. But I wanted to simply point out that we have an embryo on phenotyping landing page where you can go and look at uh, uh, the, this set of data in particular. Uh, this is what the landing page looks like. You can see, obviously, we've already moved up to many more lethal genes than our first analysis was done on. Um, you can find 3D imaging data. You can find individual vignettes, um, uh, which are small narratives uh, that allow you to uh, uh, look through the individual study, and what they do is they provide a, a short description of the mouse, the mouse model, and then links directly to all the individual data items. So this is sort of a, a format that perhaps a lot of users are more uh, uh, accustomed to. And with that, uh, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to thank again our, all of our consortium members and partners and all the people uh, for all of their hard work uh, in this project, and that's all.